So this evening I want us to consider the fatherhood of God and I want us to consider that subject in three parts. First, the relationship of God the Father and Jesus the Son. Secondly, the relationship between God the Father, Jesus the Son and the Jews. And thirdly, the relationship between God the Father and us. So as I said, I've taken most of my thoughts from the Gospel of John and it was such a joy for me to read through while noticing the constant interaction between God the Father and Jesus, God the Son. In John chapter 1, verse 1, we find that they were together right from the beginning. Jesus, being referred to as the Word, became flesh or took on human form in the form of Jesus. And John the Baptist knew exactly who Jesus was. Verse 29, he says, The Lamb of God, the sin bearer, the one who would become the sacrifice for the sins of mankind. In verse 34, he says, I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. In chapter 2, verse 16, Jesus refers to the temple as his father's house. In chapter 3, verse 34 and 35, Jesus says, The one who God has sent speaks the words of God. For God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. When Jesus is discussing where the right place to worship was with the Samaritan woman, he explained that God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. Chapter 4, verse 24. Then in chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, we find this lovely truth about the relationship between God the Father and Jesus, God the Son. Chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Again in chapter 6, we see how inseparable is the work of the Father and the Son. Chapter 6, verse 40. Jesus says, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise him up at the last days. Verse 45 Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. So isn't it wonderful to read how the Father and the Son are inseparable? Of course it's because they are. As Jesus was God in flesh and blood while on earth. Jesus throughout his ministry spent so much time trying to get the Jewish people to understand who he really was. And we'll look at that part in part two. So we'll come back to it later. But I just want to continue by highlighting chapter 8, verse 45, where Jesus replied, If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. 
Jesus in chapter 10 is trying to reason with the unbelieving Jews, which we'll look at later, as I said. But let's just highlight again this relationship of God, the Father, and God the Son. Chapter 10 and verse 14. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. You see, Jesus was in constant communication with God the Father. And we can see this when Lazarus was raised. Verse 41 of chapter 11, it says, So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here that they may believe that you have sent me. I hope you are appreciating this canter through the Gospel of John. I think it's important to get the whole picture of God who is Father, Son and Spirit working as one. Jesus is predicting his death in chapter 12 and again points to the oneness. Chapter 12, verse 26. Whoever serves me, Jesus said, must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honour the one who serves me. It's so important to understand the relationship of God as Father and Jesus as Son. Sadly, many people don't. As Jesus' time on earth was coming to its conclusion, he starts to prepare the disciples. In chapter 13, verses 1 to 3, it tells us more. We read, It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Verse 2. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Verse 3, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. What an amazing fact. Jesus came from God and now reigns with God as he did in the beginning. I just want to point out that in chapter 14, verse 2, Jesus is talking about heaven and everlasting life. So this time, when he speaks about his father's house, he is talking about heaven and not the earthly ten temple, as we mentioned previously. So in order to understand more deeply the unique relationship between God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we should read the whole of John chapter 14, really. Father is mentioned 23 times in this one chapter alone. But let's just highlight some of what is being said. Chapter 14 and verse 6. Jesus, the way to the Father. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Verse 9, anyone who has seen me 
has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? All through the teaching of Jesus, we find this somewhat hard to understand theme that God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are one. In chapter 14, verse 25 and 26, it shows this very well. Jesus says, All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send, in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. And again in John chapter 15 verse 26, we see that God is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Jesus says in chapter 15 verse 26, When the Counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. As I've tried to show through the Gospel of John, the relationship between God the Father and Jesus God the Son and also God the Holy Spirit. I hope it might encourage you to read the Gospel of John again or even for the first time. Read it through in one sitting if you can and you too will be blessed as I have been to see the Godhead at work. In John chapter 16, Father is mentioned a further 11 times. But I'll just highlight verse 28 because it speaks clearly of how God came down to earth in the form of Jesus and has now returned. Chapter 16, verse 28. Jesus said, I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. I would like to conclude our thoughts about the relationship of God, the Father and Jesus, the Son, with a comment about how Jesus left earth after being crucified, buried and resurrected from the dead. You see, by the time that the disciples and other followers of Jesus had been with him, listening to him and watching his every move, those that believed in him had no doubt whatsoever that Jesus was the Son of God and was indeed God in flesh as a man. And they must have been totally convinced that he would therefore go back to heaven. Now, so convinced were they that he would be going back to heaven that neither John nor Matthew even write about it. And Mark and Luke simply tell it as it was. I'll read how Luke says it from Luke chapter 24 and verse 50 and 51. And it simply says this. When he, Jesus, had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, Bethany, sorry, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. That's it. That's it. You would imagine there would be chapters written on it. But no, that was what they expected to happen. They expected that Jesus would be taken back to be with Father in heaven. So how can we 
be sure of a future in heaven. Well, Jesus makes it very clear in John chapter 3, verse 16, when he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. My prayer is that for everyone listening, God, the Holy Spirit, will convince you that the only way of being right with God the Father is through faith and trust in Jesus Christ, God the Son. Now for part two. I said earlier that in part two, we would consider the relationship between God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Jews, or more specifically, the Jewish religious leaders. Even though we have in this short time been able to see clearly that Jesus at all times while on earth showed and taught that he was indeed one with God, sent, directed and received again as part of the Godhead, which is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. However, they, the religious leaders, just didn't want to accept him. You see, they had done what so many do today. They had made up their minds what God should look like, how he would or even should praise them up for be keeping the laws and, as they, and they, as they looked down on others. They thought of themselves as the real deal. They thought they got their religion sorted out. They thought they knew the scriptures but had no idea what God's Messiah might be like. The one thing they were sure of and had made up their minds about was that they wouldn't accept this person, Jesus. So eventually, they killed him. Of course, I need to point out at this point at this stage, that they were only able to do that because he, Jesus, was God's planned sacrifice for the sins of mankind. So in John chapter 7, we'll see the hostility and disbelief of the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders. And we're going to read John chapter 7, verses 25 to 49. At that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, Is, Isn't this the man they are trying to kill? Here he is, speaking publicly, and they are not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Christ? But we know where this man is from. When, he, when the Christ comes, no one will know where he is from. Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. I am not here on my own, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him, because I am from him, and he sent me. At this they tried to seize him. But no one laid a hand on him, because his time had not yet come. Still many in the crowd put their faith in him. They said, When the Christ comes, will he do more miraculous signs than this man? The Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. Jesus said, I am with you, 
for only a short time. And then I go to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go, that we cannot find him? Will he go where our people live, scattered among the Greeks, and teach the Greeks? What did he mean when he said, You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is a prophet? Others said, He is the Christ. Still others asked, How can the Christ come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Verse 45, headed, Unbelief of the Jewish Leaders. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and Pharisees, who asked them, Why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards declared. You mean, he's deceived you also, the Pharisees report, retorted. Has any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. A long reading, but I wanted to give you a flavour of the hostility. So we've seen how Jesus was teaching and so clearly that the, the, the Godhead, but the hostility that he was getting from the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders, was because they had not wanted to accept him and couldn't accept him as their Messiah. And I want you to bear with me because I want to read now another quite long reading because the only way I could get it in, in proper perspective was from chapter 10. You see, we need to read chapter 10 to be able to further see that whatever great and amazing things Jesus said and did, there will always be those who refuse to accept and believe in him. Chapter 10, verse 22. Chapter 10, verse 22. Headed, the unbelief of the Jews. Then came the Feast of Dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple area, walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews gathered round him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I tell you, but you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe, because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Again the Jews picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, 
I have shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered them, it is, is it not written in your law, I have said, you are gods? If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, what about the one whom the Father set apart, as his very own, and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said, I am God's Son. Do not believe me unless I do what my Father does. But if I do it, even though you do not believe me, believe the miracles that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptising in the early days. Here he stayed, and many people came to him, and they said, Through John, though John never performed a miraculous sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed. I just want to finish part two of this talk with both a challenge and an encouragement. The challenge for everyone who is listening and does not believe yet that Jesus is the Messiah, the chosen one of God, who came to be the saviour of mankind. My challenge is, will you, with an open mind, prayerfully read the Gospel of John for yourself. I say for yourself because many are being influenced incorrectly by tutors and others who don't want to believe. And the encouragement. Well, the last verse we read was chapter 10, verse 42. And it shows us that even with all the hostility and disbelief of the religious leaders, the Holy Spirit will help you if you will come to Christ and believe. Verse 42 says, and in that place, many believed. Now for the last few minutes, I would like, to, like us to, in part three, consider the relationship between God the Father and us. I think this is very important because you see, I'm very aware that for many who are listening to me talking about God as a loving father, it's very hard for you to take. The relationship between you and your father sadly may well have been awful. Many suffer abuse at the hands of their father Many have been deserted by them. And even some of you could be living with the fear that when he comes out of jail, the torment, or even worse, may start all over again. I would like in to encourage you to see that God the Father is our Heavenly Father. His love and kindness goes beyond that of the best earthly father ever. Don't let the evil of your earthly father steal the joy that a heavenly father wants you to have. In John chapter 15 verse 8, Jesus says, This is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. By putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and following his ways, 
God the Father will help us to have fruitful lives for his glory. Verses 9 to 11 tells us that our Heavenly Father, Father's love and the joy he will give. Chapter 15, verses 9 to 11. Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. Verse 11, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Followers of Jesus Christ have a wonderful Heavenly Father whose mercy, love is beyond anything that we can ever imagine. He will never clear off and abandon us because he is faithful and never breaks his promises. I trust that we will all find much peace and joy in following him. Amen.